I'm The Voice, and this is a Divi community-produced video from the foundation. And I think that this is the, the best segue to, to start to talk about the side chains, because this is exactly what the side chains would bring to I was going to gonna say the same thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I was going to say the exact same thing just now, because it's perfectly relevant. One, there's a number, but one of the problems with the architecture of things like Ethereum, Solana, and chains like that is simply that First of all, those nodes need to be huge to handle all the all the stuff on it, but those literally get bogged down they do. in time, but also um, the costs rise simply because they decided to have the chain that does all the things. Everything. And I think that architecture is fundamentally flawed for that reason. Some, fe some of those features that are on Ethereum have come to Bitcoin, right? What happened? Fees skyrocketed. And it's not a uh, tool of the people once that happens. Miners love it, don't get me wrong. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And we want miners all, we want more miners and so forth. So one approach is to put all the stuff on the chain and then the chain handles it. And then if you want to do something else, you gotta, you gotta you know, move funds to another chain, like yeah. you know, from Ethereum to Polygon. Fundamentally, I mean, I, I've got bigger words than I think it's bad, but I just, I don't think that the path forward for crypto is this model. And they're, they're building another one now that is just, you know, it's Ethereum, but faster. And that's the whole way I understand it. It's a, another one chain to rule them on. I just yeah. fundamentally think that's broken. That's why Cosmos and Polkadot were definitely, in my view, far better architected. Um, that, you know, you got a main chain, you got nice bonds between the main chain and the side chains, um, and you do your stuff on your own side chain. <laughs> but yeah, you have to add the but. The but yeah. is a big but. There's yeah, or, you, there's, you know the but, right? Oracleization. Yeah, so you can say I have a great idea, and you can have a great implementation. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It right. definitely does. But then you start breaking down the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies. You start breaking down those fundamentals, and Satoshi is our our ultimately guide for where we start from and we extend from there. When you have oracles on there, those are centralized. There's are, there's validators. Those are elected. There's side chains, but it's a parachain kind of situation. You have one chain subservient to another chain. Every decision made on one chain isn't really real unless it's mined back to a main chain. There's all these layers of separation this has been a topic that have, has come up lately is that every time you keep adding layers, but you keep forcing it back into the throat of the main chain, everything starts to break down. You, either your sovereignty or your freedom or the flow or the ultimate goal. All of those are great technologies, but what this is, is something totally, it's totally different. That's important to understand that all those models, first of all, they, they try to address some big limitations that, that we face in, in yeah. blockchain. So one of the limitations is the scalability. That's what Rob was mentioning with the fees. It is obviously very difficult to do everything on one chain and then ever growing. Obviously, you will hit a wall very soon. And that's what we can see in the most used uh, currencies. Uh, the fees are just awful. You don't even want to move your money around. So it gets very difficult. The second thing is interoperability. Um, the ability to interact with other blockchain, expand the ecosystem instead of being stuck on one chain. And all those things basically try to address that. They all take two different approaches. Approaches that we're not taking with with a, the DV sidechain. So those two approaches are either uh, smart contracts through ZK rollups or security through the validators of the main chain. These are the two models that you can find. On one model, basically the communication between the different layers goes through a smart contract on each layer, right? And then you can have all records that are in between to get external data to validate this data. And then the Cosmos model, where the side chains are basically reliant on the validators of the main chain, and all the system is basically interdependent, and it is very limiting, and obviously it has it, it carries some security issues if 
if one is infected, then the whole the whole network can be infected. While with the DV side change, we actually come with some ideas that that completely uh, annihilate that risk. Yeah, I, I think we could spend a little bit of time. I think you described that well. The way that it's done now on Ethereum, if I move from Ethereum, actually, there's been a history which is important, I think, is that there's a project called Rootstock. Basically, the main coin is supposed to be Bitcoin, but it's an EVM, uh, like Ethereum. And you move money on Bitcoin into an address, it's the multi-sig address, and then there is this bridge, right? And that bridge is essentially, it's controlled by some people. Uh, obviously there's automation now, um, but originally it was just controlled by some people. And then they printed coins on the EVM that represented the vid Bitcoin such that the Bitcoin on the EVM is supposed to be one-to-one -to, -one to the Bitcoin on the main network. That model is most of interoperability. It's gotten better. Uh, absolutely. So the newest method you mentioned, ZK rollups, they're implementing those. That is probably the most secure way that you can do that same bridging now. And then the other thing that they do is not to have a single path. IBC is one of them for Cosmos. If you are part of the IBC, if you adopt the IBC technology, uh, it's basically a smart contract on one side, smart contract on the other side, and then a network of nodes that move the information back and forth. There's a couple other ones that are escaping me at the moment, but those are the big ones. Uh, the upcoming layer zero is another one. There's many, 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 and a growing number of these solutions that are all the same. Many flavors, but all, all yeah. the same model. All, yeah, all, all, the, all same. the same. And so, and so we should call, uh, so we call that trust minimized, right? Because you're still trusting the smart contracts on either side. You're trusting, you're trusting the code that's in the networks. There's still yeah. trust there. And somebody still is in charge of, the, of where you put the funds. I mean, so, and, and I really want point. to highlight that word because you will hear it a lot, this cycle. Because yeah. they're trying to basically still move forward. That's what I was saying, where the innovation has to move forward. And so they are trying to pass this technology for the trustless version. Exactly. So remember the difference. This is trust minimized. This is not something yeah. you will hear about DV sidechains. So this no. is why we're highlighting in, that in part. Fact, in fact, the first question you can ask is, is there a smart contract involved? <laughs> you can just ask that. And then you'll understand the difference between a trust minimized and trustless. To make this simple, if, if you're a coin owner and maybe you're getting involved in projects or maybe you're buying hardware or maybe you're going to participate in their validator, whatever you're going to do, read those key words. Those key words that they've written have been chosen specifically. Trust minimized means you have to trust me. That's all that means. It means, yes, it's minimized because of something. It's no different than somebody saying, I'm not going to store your unencrypted private keys. Well, what does that mean? Well, it sounds like I'm saying that I'm not going to store your private keys. That's not what that says. I'm going to store your private keys, which means I have to encrypt them to store them. I'm just going to store them encrypted. So you, you still don't have a trustless situation it's a trusted situation uh, yeah but i don't want to nick pick people they got a great product but I, it's just the no, farce of the marketing there is another situation we're talking about i was reading about a hardware device today and that device is promoting how it doesn't store your private keys you read the key words it says private keys never saved or it says does not permanently store your private keys. What does that mean? Clients don't read that. They read those words and they're thinking, oh, my private keys are never anywhere near this device. It's sterile. Yeah, I think one was uh, we don't store unencrypted private keys. Yeah, they don't store unencrypted <laughs> private keys. Exactly. Well, these other devices will tell you, oh, I don't store your private keys permanently. Oh, my goodness. Reread those words. That's the way some of these blockchains are deploying some of these smart contracts. There is trust involved. It's trust minimized, which means, yeah, sure, you're not giving over everything and walking away and hoping to get something back. There is some layer of, I don't want to say it protections in there, but we'll, we'll call it stop gaps or whatever. But the fact is, is that something bad in many cases has happened 
And Neegs, you produced a report not too long ago about these platforms that are smart contract platforms that have been manipulated. These are trust minimized platforms. You're getting involved in these platforms and these people are losing stuff. This is a common thing. It's been happening That's with right. smart contracts. We're talking about more than three billion lost in just a, a few years. Three billion lost. Yeah.